So let's continue with uh, our approximation to the Navier-Stokes equations, trying to model turbulence. So let's see which are the modeling conditions and the energy balance equation. So there are there are several points, several questions that determine whether you are able to model turbulence or not. There are many. I, I, here I have uh, listed a few. First is are flow bifurcations properly captured? So as I mentioned before. The different stages of the flow uh, come from the different flow bifurcations, hop bifurcations, that happen at a certain Reynolds number. So it is very important to see whether you are able to capture that Reynolds number at which bifurcation takes place. Okay? That means that at least transition will be, can be reproduced. Maybe not fully developed turbulent flow, but at least transition. This is the most important one, definitely. So this is exactly, if, if that is not satisfied, you can throw away the model. So the problem, the, the most important issue is, is the Kolmogorov energy cascade properly reproduced? So that means that you are able to reproduce the inertial range, at least part of it. Okay, this is the most important thing. Uh, another question is, is, is it possible to, po to reproduce backscatter? What is backscatter? Well, th this is a physical concept. <coughs> uh, it turns out that uh, it is commonly said that in turbulence, energy flows from large scales into small scales. What does that mean? It, m it means that you have a big vortex that breaks down into a smaller vortices that in turn break down into smaller vortices and so on and so forth. So th that is precisely why the energy cascade is decreasing. So the amplitudes are decreasing. When you increase the, uh, the wave number, you have less and less energy. Okay? Um, however, it may happen that at isolated points, not, not the in, the, in an integral sense, but at isolated points, at a certain time instance, small vortices group together into larger vortices. That may happen, okay? And that is what is called backscatter. There is a transfer of energy from uh, uh, small scales into large scales. So two small vortices collapse into a larger one, and that gives, uh, that gives a contribution to the energy of... Uh, of a small scales, okay? Well, uh, more conditions. That this is what I mentioned this morning. Is the dimension of the global attractor properly reproduced? That is the uh, heuristic estimate. That uh, I mentioned that this morning. I didn't know that I had written it here. So uh, that's the estimate, the heuristic estimate, and this is the close that the closest that is proved analytically. Um, so the estimate of the, uh, the uh, dimension of the proper attractor is. Uh, um, Reynolds number to the power of 4.8 instead of uh, 1.2 or something. Okay. Well, this is an integer. This is this can be expressed as a, as a rational number, but I don't remember which one. So it was, it is uh, 24 over 5, right? Yes, 24 over 5. So uh, another another um, important property. Uh, this is very important. Also, I mean, uh, the other property is, are turbulent boundary layers properly approximated? So you, if you haven't taken any course in fluid mechanics, you don't know what it is, but it happens that uh, close to boundaries, close to boundaries, the flow displays a region where there is a rapid variation of the velocity profile. So this is the velocity. Okay, this is the velocity. Those are called boundary layers. Those are called boundary layers. And boundary layers for fully developed flow have a certain profile. I mean, the profile is well known. Have a, a certain, in particular, a lo have a logarithmic profile. The shape is logarithmic, uh, close to the boundary. So that has to be uh, um, um, appropriately reproduced. So this is another question. This is another modeling condition. Okay. Are shear layers properly reproduced? What is a shear layer? A shear layer is also a region where the flow, uh, the velocity has a. a a high, a strong variation, but not near the boundary, but in the mean flow. Imagine you have a, a fluid going in one di uh, so uh, some streamlines going in one direction, in direction, and then streamlines going in the other direction. Okay, so then there will be a region in which there will be a change in the sign of the velocity. Okay, so that region is very thin if the viscosity is small, and is uh, thicker if the viscosity is high. So those are called shear layers. Those are called boundary layers, and those are called shear layers. You don't need to have a change in sign. You don't need to have a change in sign. You have to have only an important gradient in the velocity. Okay. 
So uh, shear layers uh, also have their own behavior in the case of turbulent pro uh, flows. Is the energy decay in time properly uh, captured? What is the energy decay in time? Well, this is also an important point. Uh, as as uh, we have seen, the energy for a fixed time, for a fixed time, has an energy cascade that is what we have seen. This is called energy cascade. Okay? Energy in terms of time is something, and then the inertial range and the dissipation range. Okay? That is for a fixed time. This is the energy which depends on the wave number and time for a fixed time. Okay? However, energy decays in time. Why it decays? Because if you don't excite the flow, then the flow will, at, at the end, you will have a flow at rest. Okay? So the energy decays. The energy decays. Okay? And if you pick a certain wave number, if you pick a certain wave number, and you plot energy against time, not against wave number, but against time, you will observe an exponential decay that depends on the viscosity. So the higher the viscosity, the faster the decay. Okay? And that has to be uh, also properly captured, properly reproduced. In particular, uh, is relaminarization properly predicted? What does that mean? When you decrease the energy, imagine you don't excite the flow. Okay? The flow is turbulent. But when you, uh, when you, uh, if you don't excite it, the energy decays, and therefore the Reynolds number get is uh, gets smaller and smaller, up to a point where the flow will be laminar again. Okay, will be laminar again, and then that is what is called relaminarization. That has to be properly predicted as well. Okay, what does it mean flow laminar again? I haven't said that, but remember the very first slide or the, one of the first slides. This one. You know, when is the flow called laminar in, st in stages one, two, or three? Okay, in stages one, two, or three, up to here, we say that the flow is laminar. In stage four, we say that the flow is chaotic, the flow is turbulent. Okay, but uh, you see that re re uh, a laminar flow does not mean a stationary flow. A laminar flow means a flow wi which only has large structures. It doesn't have a chaotic behavior. It only has large structures. Okay. That's what relaminarization re is. OK, so then we have a theoretical ask, a question. Do a, a, a solutions converge to suitable solutions? You know, that we have to prove that the solution of our, uh, pro, our uh, model converges to the suit a suitable solution. Do you remember what a suitable solution is? Is the, uh, the definition introduced by Schaeffer? Uh, is a solution that satisfies the entropy inequality. Of course, we will not be able to prove uniqueness. We would win uh, one million dollars, okay? But we we are able to prove, and in fact, in our group, uh, we have proved that um, that the solutions do converge to suitable solutions, okay? Weekly, um, and uh, and we have a paper about that. Not myself, but uh, my colleagues. So uh, uh, solutions uh, uh, converge to suitable solutions. That means that suitable, uh, we converge to a suitable solution. <laughs> you see, we, uh, it's, uh, we have to be careful with the language. The, uh, our solutions converge to a suitable solution. Hopefully, that would be the un unique solution, but, but we are not able to prove that. Okay. And any other question? You so, what is the message of this list uh, list of points? So, these uh, three slides: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight points. So the, the, the message is that there are characteristic features of turbulence that have to be reproduced if you claim to have a turbulence model. Okay. So you have this is a checklist that you have to uh, that you have to answer. So we have answered for most of these questions, but not for all of them. So let's let's do something that is very important in, in turbulence, which is the a global kinetic energy balance, uh, the, the global kinetic energy balance equations. To write down those energies. Um, I mean, in general, you, you can prove. Uh, let me pose a question. I, I don't know. The, the answer is that I don't know exactly. The point is that you can prove existence. How do you do that? By typical Galorkin approximation, taking the limit. It's not easy to take the limit. Okay, you have to work in the appropriate topology, and so on. This was done in in, in bounded domains by, by Hopf. 
and um, but essentially is a essentially is a Golurkin method. Okay. However, once you know that there is a solution, you cannot prove uniqueness. Um, uniqueness usually is done by is proved by taking the difference and then making sure that the norm of the difference goes goes to zero, uh, as the typically a regularization parameter goes to zero. In this case, uh, the problem is taking those limits. Those limits you cannot guarantee that they exist. Uh, you know, in in, in 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 other problems, what do you use? You use uh, the dominate dominant convergence theorem. You use those th those theorems in analysis. I mean, classically. Okay. In in in, you know, in fluid mechanics, you also use uh, the so-called topological methods, degree methods. I don't know. Well, you know, you have heard of those, but you also use methods that allow you to guarantee uh, uniqueness in some cases, but not for the full Navier-Stokes equation. So, I mean, um, uh, so the exact answer I don't know. I know how to uh, that. I have seen many papers proving existence, but um, of course I haven't seen any proven uniqueness. So the problem is that uh, that cannot be. Ah, yes, yes, yes. I know, I know, I know one thing. Yes, I know one thing. I know one thing. There is, for example, a paper, by the way, by 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 Gibbon, where he shows, for example, that uh, that property that I was mentioning, that if if the solution is in H2 in space or L4 in t L4, so L infinity L4, all or L2 uh, H2, then you have uniqueness. And then it, that's very illustrative because you see that there is a limit that if you want to bound, you need to have more regularity. So if you don't, that limit does not necessarily exist. Uh, is that, so I mean, the exact reason I don't know. But you, I know the details that, that uh, at least uh, explain why the proof is so difficult. It's an open problem. So let's. Uh, uh, write down the global uh, kinetic energy balance equations. So <coughs> these we have seen. Suppose that, that, that there are no uh, external forces. Okay. Suppose that there are no external forces. So the equation that we want to solve is um, is uh, is this one: du dt plus u gradient of, e of minus u Laplacian of u plus gradient of p equal to zero. And we have an initial condition. Okay. So first, we have the uh, 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 balance of kinetic energy, assuming the solution exists and is unique, which is very easy to obtain. We just test this against u and get this expression. First, th that term will lead to the uh, time derivative of the kinetic energy. It is obvious. That term will be 0. We know that. It's the, um, the convective term, and that term will also be zero because of the incompressibility of u. Okay, divergence of u is equal to zero. So we are left with this one, which is the integral over the domain omega of this term, nu gradient of u squared. That's the so-called the molecular dissipation. Okay, it's the so-called molecular dissipation. It's a dissipate. It's a dissipative term. This is obvious from here because you see that if this term is positive, positive, the kinetic energy will decay. So the derivative of the kinetic energy, you move it to the right hand side, will be negative. Okay? So the viscosity has to be positive. Good. What happens if you introduce an LES model? If you introduce an LES model, what happens is that you have the same energy balance as before, exactly the same, plus the dissipation introduced by the LES model. Which is this dissipation? Let's go back. It's the one introduced by this term divergence of t. The, that introduces an additional dissipation, divergence of t, where t is given by this expression. Okay. T is given by this expression. Good. So that's what you have using an LES model. Now what happens if you use if you use a numerical model without an L, a large eddy simulation model? So without Smagorinsky. There are many models. Magorinsky is the, the most famous, but there's Hermano, there is Gradient, there is Clark. Anyway, there are different LES models. But suppose that uh, you use just the Navier Stokes equations with the numerical dissipation introduced by the method. The method has dissipation. We will see how is that dissipation in our case. But the method has dissipation. So we would have this. Okay? And what would happen if you trust the LES model as a physical model? Then you should discretize the equations using finite terms, for example, right? If you do that, if you discretize the LES model, 
you will have two contributions, one from the numerical dissipation of your model and the other from the numerical dissipation of the LES model. So that's the picture. If that's the continuous case, this is the continuous case. <coughs> this is an LES model at the continuous level. I mean, of course, I mean, this is uh, just uh, an abstract concept because uh, uh, if we have an LES model, we have to approximate it. That would be a, new, uh, a stabilized finite element method without LES, without LES. And that would be a stabilized finite element method with LES, okay? So, when is an LES model good? When is an LES model good? Of course, at the end, you have to satisfy the, the points in the checklist that I have shown before. But when is an LES model good? So the idea of LES is the following. <coughs> the idea of LES is, <coughs> look, let me see if I can explain that. That is the kinetic energy, okay? The kinetic energy of the exact velocity. And that is the kinetic en energy of the filtered velocity, okay? So the first assumption that we do from the physical point of view is that the kinetic energy is contained in the large scales. So the first assumption is that the filtered velocity has a kinetic energy that is equal to the total kinetic energy. Okay, that's the first assumption. Second assumption, the large scales almost introduce no dissipation. Why? Here, we have the molecular dissipation integrated over omega, and that is the exact one. And here, you have the expression of that molecular dissipation. So, the viscosity might be very small, 10 to the minus 8. But, since this is the total velocity, it will have all the components of the velocity. And there will be gradients that will be very, very, very high. Okay? Therefore, even if this is extremely small, there will be components in the velocity with extremely high gradients, the, very, the highly fluctuating velocities, and therefore, this number will be finite. This number will be of order 1, let's say. And then that integral will be the total dissipation of the flow. When we go to the filtered equation, what happens? What happens with the filtered velocity? The filtered velocity only contains the large scales, so the, the, you know, the large uh, variations. And therefore, if we multiply that by a very small number, because we are interested in high Reynolds number flows, this is going to be negligible. Okay. So, two points. First, the kinetic energy of the total velocity is essential the kinetic energy of the filtered velocity, or the large scale velocity, if you want to say. And second point, the dissipation of the large scales is negligible in the fully developed turbulence. Therefore, Lili's argument, argument was that a good, an LES model has to satisfy that the dissipation introduced by the LES model is equal to the molecular dissipation. That's what LES model, uh, an LES model has to satisfy. And this is the so-called uh, Lilly's argument. So first, the kinetic energy of the total velocity is approximately equal to the kinetic energy of the, last, of the large scales. And second, the dissipation of the large scales is negligible. Therefore, we have to satisfy that concept. Okay, and what happens at the numerical level? We could argue the same at the numerical level. At the numerical level, we have the uh, we assume that we may assume that we capture all the kinetic energy. So we may assume that if, if we if we, our mesh is good enough, all the kinetic energy of the flow will be reproduced by our finite element solution, and also the dissipation of the finite element solution can be considered to be negligible. So the point is, is our numerical dissipation uh, or does our numerical dissipation have a behavior similar to the molecular one? So that's the point. We can argue exactly the same. If we were able to prove that our numerical dissipation behaves as the molecular dissipation, if this is equal to this in the limit and in a certain asymptotic sense, then why would you use an LES model? That is absolutely unnecessary. So discretizing an LES equation is unnecessary. If this is already equal to this, if this is already equal to this, that could be redundant. 
So this is a point under debate. That is, uh, there is a lot of research in that. But th that is not the first model with these uh, uh, characteristics. This is what is called, I mean, assuming that the numerical model, the numerical model already behaves as an LES model, is what is called IELTS. And IELTS stands for implicit, implicit large eddy simulation. Okay? Implicit large eddy simulation, which means that we rely on the dissipation of our numerical scheme to simulate turbulence. Okay? So there are groups in the world, so that this is uh, the fact, that believe that this is not a correct approach. But there are groups that believe, and we are one of these groups, that that is the correct approach. Okay? So as I said, that's not um, objective, what I'm saying, but uh, our particular point of view. So, and the point is, if you discretize an LES model and you have proved that, this is absolutely redundant, okay? So, uh, we have proved that, by the way. We have proved uh, in a paper that, by the way, was published not that long ago, in 2015, I guess, I guess that this happens. Uh, excuse me. That this happens. That the numerical dissipation we have is uh, behaves in the same way as the molecular dissipation. We proved that in, in a paper published a couple of years ago. Okay. So, features of our variational multiscale model. Uh, some drawbacks of large eddy simulation are, which is the appropriate filter? So, I, I don't like LES, I have to confess. <laughs> I mean, uh, we, because it's everything is, you know, like uh, uh, hands waving. You know, uh, which is the appropriate filter? Which is the appropriate closure? For, we have seen one of them, which is uh, Smagorinsky's. What happens close to boundaries? Because if you filter huh, close to boundaries, what happens? Imagine you have a boundary. And you want to filter at that point, but the filter width is this one. Huh. What happens if you go outside the computational domain? So filtering is a process that is not that clear in the case. Um, and what we have assumed that differentiation and filtering do not uh, uh, do commute. But what happens if they don't commute? In fact, they don't commute. One can show that for most filters, derivatives and filtering does not commute. So that depends on the kernel, but for most kernels, it doesn't commute. How do large eddy simulation and numerical dissipations interact? That this is what we have seen here. How do these two dissipations interact? Do they add each other? Do you have twice of what you need or more than that? So anyway, uh, and from the computational point of view, apart from this Maurinsky model, which is trivial, large eddy simulations in general are difficult to implement. I mean, for example, dynamic models require the evaluation of a certain tensor that, de that is non-local, that depends on, uh, on the neighborhood of the points. Well, in general, they are difficult to implement. So which is the, our, our approach? We use a variational multiscale stabilized formulation in the sense that I have been explaining. With, uh, uh, these are based in general simplifying assumptions that we have seen. Our approach, however, is to accept the multiscale decomposition with all its consequences. In particular, that's our approach. Okay? In particular, we consider the subscales time dependent and we keep the nonlinear terms involving u tilde. This is important because what do we mean by that? Well, I have that written, so I have that written, so that's. <coughs> what is the reward you, you gain? First, the dependence of the subscales with time, the time step size of the time integration scheme becomes clear. And not only that, we have <coughs> papers proving that uh, you improve the uh, error of the time integration scheme. And above all, you, you improve the conditions between delta T and H that are required. We have better conservation of momentum. We can show this analytically. And modeling of the subscales defines automatically a model for the extra stress of pre an LES-like approach. I will mention that. I will mention this uh, next. OK, so let's see. What do we mean by keeping the nonlinear dependencies of the subscales? We mean this. If we uh, expand the convective term, we have four terms. One is UH gradient of UH, UH gradient of U tilde, U tilde gradient of UH, and U tilde gradient of U tilde. Okay? So what people do in general, as I said yesterday, is to linearize, our, they say that they linearize around UH, around UH, and they neglect those two terms. So what is that? That is the basic Galerkin term. So if you keep this, you are doing Galerkin. 
That is what gives numerical stability by, inter by integrating this by parts. This is what provides the streamlined control. Do you remember that? that we, did, we did the integration by parts of this, and we recovered uh, the uh, convective operator applied to the test function. The convective operator apl applied to the test function multiplied by the, by the convective term that appears in U tilde in the residual of the finite domain scale is what gives you stability control, so that, uh, convection stability. So that is essential for numerical stability. We have shown that that is crucial. Keeping this term is crucial for momentum conservation. Momentum is just uh, u or rho u, the moment of rho u. And that might be an approximation to the so-called subgrid scale tensor. That might be an approximation to the subgrid scale tensor. And then the point is, is are terms 1 plus 2 plus 3 a good turbulence model? Our belief is that they are. And we have shown in many examples that they behave as a turbulence model. Likewise, we also keep the time dependency of the subgrid scales. We call, we call this dynamic subgrid scale. So if you take the time derivative of u, you get the time derivative of uh plus the time derivative of u tilde. So we don't neglect the time derivative of the subscales. Okay. Okay. So we have some interesting properties by doing that. Then the first one is uh, I haven't talked much about that, but I will explain that what we mean. This is something that I mentioned very briefly the other day, but uh, now I will elaborate a little more on that. We favor what we call orthogonal subscales. What does that mean? Remember, let, let, let me explain that for the convection diffusion equation. It's very simple. So for the, we have the equation for the subscales, which is this one. Do you remember that? This in the space uh, B tilde. In fact, what we have, in fact, what we have is that the projection of, the, the, of this operator on the space of subgrid scales is equal to the projection of this operator. Using any argument, we want, we're going to approximate LU tilde. We will approximate that with any argument you wish by tau minus 1, a certain parameter, times times U tilde. So we will replace the differential operator by an algebraic operator. Okay, that's what uh, I explained. For example, using the Fourier argument. I think it's the cleanest, but it's up to you. You can use bubbles. You can use uh, Green's functions. Okay, we approximate that. So the projection on the space of subscales of L u tilde will be approximated by tau minus 1 u tilde. Because this is a scalar, so the projection of u tilde onto its space is going to be u tilde, obviously. Okay? Then we have that the solution to that equation is u tilde equals to tau projection of f minus L u tilde. This is exactly, this is the, the good equation, okay? Well, we may define the projection weighted and whatever, but it is, this is the good equation for the subscales with this essential approximation, okay? This is general. Assume we have a scalar problem, problem but that could be also applied to, to systems. Is that clear? Good. If this is clear, then it is clear that we have to define which is the space of subscales. So now let's uh, plot an, uh, an abstract draw, drawing, which is the following. Suppose that this is the finite element space. And this is the whole space. This is the whole space V. So that's the whole space V, and that's our finite element space. Okay? So saying, saying approximating P, uh, P of F minus L of UH, approximating that by F minus L of UH, what does that mean? Suppose that f is a constant or any function. What does that mean? In fact, in fact what it means is that we are taking the space of subscales, which should be uh, the complement, the complement of VH. We are taking that as the space of finite element residuals. So that means that the space of subscales is such that when you take a finite element function. You apply the operator L to it, and you get a function that belongs to that space. That's why we have replaced P tilde by the identity, but by the identity applied to finite element residuals. Okay? So that's one approximation that 
90% of the people of the people do, or 95. So, so what do we do? We don't do that. What we do is we take P tilde equals to the projection orthogonal to the finite element space. Okay? Both options are possible. Both options are possible. So what does that mean? It means that we have to reproduce the whole space, but we can reproduce that with the orthogonal to the finite element space. That's what, is, uh, that's what we take as our, our, our space of Socrates scales, of, or we could do it with uh, something else. Okay, we could, we, we, we could make something else. So both methods are uh, uh, reasonable, okay? are correct, are acceptable. But what we do is this. We take the space of subscales orthogonal to the finite element space. That means that we take our finite element, our subgrid scale approximation as tau times the orthogonal projection to the finite element residual. And what is that? That is easy to compute because the orthogonal projection, what is, uh, if this is the residual, if this is the residual, what is the orthogonal projection of the residual? The orthogonal projection of the residual is the residual itself minus the projection of the residual onto the finite element space. Okay? The orthogonal projection is the, the, the orthogonal projection of any residual. If you have the residual, if that is the residual, which does not, of course, the residual does not belong to the finite element space. Why does not the residual belong to the finite element space? Can anybody tell me why the residual does not belong to the finite element space? For example, look at the convective term, A gradient of U. If U belongs to the finite element space, why the residual does not belong to the finite element space? Imagine A is constant. So, 1D, 1D problem. Why, if you have UH, a finite element function, A, the UDA, the, the, the UH, dx does not belong to the finite element space. What? Imagine I have a function like that. I have a function like that, which is a finite element function. Okay, uh. Why? How does a d a d u h dx look like? Well, it's uh, a duxx is a constant here, another constant here, and another constant here. And that function does not belong to the finite element space. It's not continuous. You see? It's a function that lies outside the finite element space. Therefore, um, we have a residual that does not belong to the finite element space. We compute the projection of the residual onto the finite element space, the L2 projection, and the residual minus the L2 projection is the orthogonal component of the residual. Okay? Do you understand? That's the method we propose. There is a projection involved that you have to do, but there are, we believe, many advantages. Many advantages. This is the idea. Okay. Then we proved. The fo we assume in, no in all our analysis, we assume that we use orthogonal subgrid scales. So the velocities are orthogonal to the finite element space. We assume that the finite element mesh is able to capture at least part of the inertial range. We have to assume that. That is what I said several times already. We have to assume that our finite element mesh has 1 over h, which is a, a, a characteristic wave number. 1 over h is somewhere here in the inertial range, because otherwise we are not simulating any turbulent flow. And we also assume that the classical assumptions of statistical fluid mechanics apply. Hmm? So this is classical. Then, uh, what do we get? The, wh which are our equations? Our equations are. Uh, this, this was done for a stationary problem. If we have a time-dependent problem, as Navier Stokes, we have this. The time derivative of u tilde plus tau minus 1, which is the approximation to the Navier Stokes operator, u tilde, equal to the finite element resi momentum residual, the residual of the first equation. And that is for the, sec for the second equation. Then we were able to show 
that the dissipation introduced by our model is already proportional to the molecular dissipation. So in a sense, what uh, I told you is that we were able to prove to prove uh, this, okay? We were able, no, no, not this, but that, that our numerical dissipation is proportional to uh, the molecular dissipation. So we were able to prove that. Okay, we are happy with this. Which is the um, value of the algorithmic constant, C? Remember, I mentioned that the parameter tau 1 has to be taken, we take it as a constant times the viscosity divided by h, h squared plus another constant times, in this case, the L infinity norm of the velocity, this is a characteristic velocity, divided over, over h. Okay? And tau 2 has to be taken h, h squared over tau 1. That constant that appears in the first term, let's call it c squared, and that has to be c. It can be shown that that is c squared and that's c. For example, by using the Fourier argument, that can be shown. But the problem is uh, that we are able to find the constant. So we have now, what's the message of this? Using this argument, we have a way to obtain the constant c. Which is that way to obtain the constant c? By imposing not only that the dissipation of the model is proportional to the molecular dissipation, but equal. We can even have uh, a situations in which we equate the numerical dissipation to the molecular dissipation. And, um, and this is the idea. Find of, uh, so we have this, and we, the idea is find C such that we have this property. Of course, this can be done only through a posteriori error estimation, and I will not explain that. Well, another important, very, very important point about the dissipative structure of the method that only happens with, with orthogonal subscales and dynamic subscales. This is very easy to understand. So you don't have to, uh, let's say, uh, think much about this. Look, what happens if we have orthogonal and uh, time-dependent subscales? Both. In the momentum equation, we have time derivative of u, h, uh, plus time derivative of, um, of u tilde, comma, test function, test function, plus uh, additional terms, hmm? plus additional terms, equal to the right-hand side. And you want to write down the energy balance equation. In fact, the right-hand side, let, let me express it, the right-hand side is f dot v, f dot v. Okay, that is the original equation, right? Now assume we take vh equal, excuse me, yes, vh equal to the finite element function. You take vh equal to the finite element function. What will happen? Hmm. This is important. If we take uh equal to the finite element function, and we have taken the subspace orthogonal to the finite element space, what will happen with this term? Zero. It will be zero. This is great. It will be zero. We will have that term will lead one half of the derivative with respect to time of the norm of uh squared. This is because we have taken orthogonal subscales doesn't happen if you don't do that. And when you take the test function, sorry, sorry, the test function equal to it, and when you take the test function equal to u tilde, to u tilde, what you will have is one half of the derivative of the energy of the subscales. Okay? So, two important points. First, because you take orthogonal subscales, the two kinetic energies uncouple, in general, you would have that plus the kinetic energy of the subscales and the same here, or a certain term, a coupling term. First point, because uh, the subscales are orthogonal, the kinetic energy of the larger scales and the kinetic energy of the small scales, the subscales, we can call them small scales, uncouple. And second, um, that kinetic energy is accounted for. So we take into account the kinetic energy of the supreme scales. So it can be shown, and it's not very difficult, that the mathematical structure of the dissipation equations is this one. So this is a beautiful term. Uh, uh, from the physical point of view, this is beautiful. Why? We have that the time derivative of the kinetic energy of the larger scales plus a dissipation of the larger scales plus a term that comes from the subscales is equal to the external power 
the large scales of the external power. That is F dot uh, 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 inner product with VH. And we are able to obtain a similar equation for the subscales. The time derivative of the subgrid uh, uh, energy of the subgrid scales plus a dissipation of the subgrid scales minus a certain term equal to the external power. And it can be shown, that is what is great, that is what is great, that this term T is the same as this one with the change in sign. I mean, if, of course, the details are written in our papers, but this is easy. I think the, the final result is easy to understand. It turns out that this term is equal to this one. And what does that mean? It means that this term is dissipative for the uh, large scales, because it's positive. Well, I have a comment on that. It's positive, and this term is negative for the small scales. It means that we are transferring. If this term is positive, we are transferring energy from the large scales to the small scales. So this is exactly, this is exactly what needs to be obtained. So by taking the subscales orthogonal to the finite element scales and time dependent, we are able to reproduce what is really necessary to reproduce from the physical point of view. This is the, ba the balance of the kinetic energy of the large scales, and this is the balance of the kinetic energy of the small scales. As you see, uh, the time derivative of, key of k, the kinetic energy of the small scale, does not apply for quasi-static subscales. So this is not physically reasonable. And the point is that we are also able to show that in mean, in mean, t is positive, but that can be point-wise negative. So we have, we may have backscatter. So t negative would mean that the energy of the large scales increases at the expense of a decrease in energy of the smaller scale. So this is beautiful. No, that's the. So, what have we checked analytically? We have checked uh, analytical numerically. In fact, more than that. We have checked that the, the numeric, as I mentioned, that the numerical dissipation is proportional to the molecular dissipation. We have proved analytically this. So this is the work we have done in this topic. We have checked that our uh, spectrum behaves as it, it has to be, as it has to behave. We have checked that we can reproduce backscatter, contrary to most uh, turbulence models. Uh, we have proved analytically that uh, there exists an attractor for the resolvable scales. We have shown also numerically that turbulent boundary layers have the correct profile. And there are things that we still have to check, in fact, that we had to check at that time. Um, for example, those are the points in the checklist that I mentioned before. For example, we have already proved convergence to suitable solutions, so that point is, is checked. Uh, we don't have an estimate for the dimension of the discrete attractor, but we do have an estimate for the dimension of the attractor associated to the subscale. So we hope that will lead us to a final estimate. We'll see. Uh, we haven't done anything about bifurcation. Um, well, that's, that's what I said that is, uh, is remaining. We have checked numerically that energy decays at the correct rate. rate. We have a paper published l last year showing this, by the way. Uh, so this, so th some th this, this uh, talk is from, 90, from two, uh, two, uh, 2012, but we have been working on that since then. Uh, we haven't paid my, that much attention to that, to the spreading of shear layers, but I am sure that will work uh, correctly. And finally, let me show a few examples. Uh, how do those are from 2012? So we have many more uh, examples that are much more complex now. But for example, this is a benchmark. This is a plate, a round plate, put in a column in a wind tunnel, that is uh, that is tested uh, experimentally. So we computed the flow over that plate. And we, th this is the, you see, this is the uh, uh, experimental spectrum. You see what I told you? Um, the spectrum is not as nice as I have plotted before. So that, that is the spectrum. First you have, first you have a more or less uh, a variation like that, you know. But then you have that is uh, noisy because the flow is turbulent, fully turbulent, and that's what you get. This is what we got numerically, okay. This is what we got numerically, which was uh, in perfect agreement with the slope that we should have got. This is pressure against frequency. It's not energy against wave number. This is pressure against frequency. And the correct slope should be minus uh, three, uh, over, uh, 7 over 3. And this is what we got with our model. By the way, with another model, which is too dissipative, we got a, sl a slope that, as you see, is a, li a little bit more, um, a little bit higher. Well, those are the snapshots of the flow. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yes, here, for example, we plot points. Uh, that, ah, no, that, this is another problem, sorry. This is another problem. 
that was the flow over a flat plate. This is another problem. This is a very, apparently it's very simple. It's the flow over an obstacle. Okay, you have an obstacle here. You see that square, and there is flow coming from the left and passing this obstacle. So there is a, a big vortex here, and all, as I said before, all small scales are behind the vortex. So um, that that is a picture of the flow pattern. So uh, there are many many scales uh, alive here. In that, exam that example, we showed several things. How is the average total dissipation? Many things, but in particular, it is, it was, that example was interesting to show that there are spots, there are points, isolated points, where that, that uh, transfer function t was negative. So that means that there are trans po points where small vortices can collapse into large vortices. So that is backscatter. Okay? Well, this is a real example that we had. This is the flow around the telescope enclosure. We had a project at that time uh, uh, simulating that flow. So this is the simulation. But because it turns out that uh, uh, capturing the flow, the turbulent flow pattern around telescopes is critical to determine the optical quality of the atmosphere surrounding the telescope. Okay? We have had several projects dealing with that. Again, we, we compute the spectrum. This is what uh, makes you feel uh, good, makes you feel that you really have a turbulent flow. You see? You see that slope? That slope is perfect. It's exactly what you should get. So we are really in the inertial range. Of course, the inertial range may go up to a certain point that we may not capture. But what we have to make sure is that we are able to capture part of the inertial range. Okay, that is the message. And then, then, then we compare some quantities. That is the mean velocity. And that is the so-called turbulent intensity, which is, in, uh, let's say, the deviation, the standard deviation from the mean velocity. And then we compare results of our model against other models. And of course, the conclusion is that ours is the best. Otherwise, we wouldn't put the, <laughs> the results here. And that's it. Um, that was it. So we concluded from that uh, that the inertial range is certainly found, that backscatter can be observed, that we obtain classical, uh, richer dynamics, where I have insisted on that, uh, than using classical LES model. And, and that's it. And that's the summary. Well, that's. Um, we have uh, that was a talk that as I said before and, and that is not a talk but a session so I think I will stop here that topic okay so that's um, that's for in what concerns a, a, a brief introduction to what we have done in variational multiscale in variational multiscale applied to applied to um, what happens it doesn't close you know applied to Incompressible navier stokes Okay, good. So let's move to RC. Second topic, second application topic. This is a more recent talk that I gave in in a, in a conference uh, not that long ago, less than a year ago. Okay, less than a year. I will touch not all the points. There is one that I will not touch because I think it's not uh, interesting, interesting for this audience. Um, I will not touch point number seven, okay, but I will touch all the other points. I will try to touch. So uh, I'll talk about Darcy's problem, and I want to insist on the, on the distinction between the primal and the dual forms. Then we will move to Brinkman's problem, which is just Darcy with some viscosity, and develop a general framework that is able to encompass both limit cases, Darcy and Stokes. Then we will see how to design a stabilized finite element methods for that and see which are the optimal error estimates that we have been able to get. Okay? And finally, some numerical tests. So as I said, I will skip the point about the weak imposition of essential boundary conditions. So this is essentially a talk about Darcy's problem and also Darcy combined with the Stokes and using our, our um, stabilized finite element approximation that is based on the variational multiscale concept. Okay? So the first point I think is important because it's it's uh, it's general. Okay. Which are the objectives of this talk? That was an, an hour talk in a, in a conference, so that I will try to keep it to an hour or less. So half an hour today and half an hour tomorrow morning. So uh, which are the objectives? The objectives are first to stress the importance of the primal and the dual forms of that cis problem. So this is important to understand. Okay. Then to develop a functional framework for the Stokes Darcy problem, which is also known as Brinkman's problem. Okay, that is called Brinkman's problem as well, which is well behaved when the viscosity tends to zero. So that would be that would be the uh, uh, Stokes uh, uh, Darcy limit, 
And when sigma tends to zero, sigma is the inverse, uh, uh, the, the, the inverse of the permeability. So the permeability is uh, uh, is uh, infinity. Okay, so sigma goes to zero. Uh, we will propose methods that are optimally stable and optimally convergent for any interpolation without satisfying the Ipsum stability condition. So uh, that's our goal. Okay, that's why uh, um, stabilized and entanglement methods are designed for. Okay, so this is why. We will uh, try to present that. Uh, and that topic, I will not touch it. So the method to prescribe boundary conditions, I will not touch this point. Which are the key ingredients? The first is a variational multi-scale method. So a two-scale, in fact, it's multi-scale. I said that two-scale is a little bit uh, too much uh, hypo. It's uh, always two-scale. A two-scale decomposition of the velocity and the pressure within the variational multi-scale framework. It is very important to have a proper scaling of the problem. Remember, units matter, and matter a lot in numerical analysis. Okay, Not in analysis, but in numerical analysis. And then uh, uh, we will show, or I will show, a closed form expression for the subscales based on an approximate Fourier analysis. I will not elaborate it here. But uh, again, let me mention that that Fourier analysis that I mentioned the other day is useful for all, at least, for all the problems that we have considered so far. I don't know that it will work always, but at least so far, so good. So it has, it, it has been useful in all the problems that we have uh, uh, treated, that we have dealt with. And that topic, I will not touch it. OK. Um, we will propose two stabilized finite element methods. In particular, we will propose one in which uh, the space of subscales is essentially the space of residuals, so that, uh, that this one. Uh, where was it? The, the space of residuals, so, okay, well, and the other in which the space of subscales is orthogonal to the space of residuals. Okay, so in one case we take p tilde equal to the identity. So in one in one case we take that, and in the other case we take it orthogonal to the finite element space. Okay, and these methods uh, sh show similar properties. They st uh, they have similar stability and convergence properties, and these are. Optimally, optimal stability in the Stokes problem and also in the Arsis problem, and optimal convergence. But the optimality in this case, as we will see, is determined by the length scale. So this is, again, very important. OK, so let's go to the first point, which is uh, very, like, I would say, general. So it's something that uh, I think there is sometimes misunderstanding, which is the Arsis problem. By the way, misunderstanding by people um, I mean, that simply pay, have paid no attention to that, but should know that. Uh, you will see, for example, stabilization methods for the RCS problem that are not properly designed because the functional setting, setting is not properly well designed. So let's consider uh, the RCS problem. OK, the RCS problem. Suppose that we have uh, a domain in RD, as usual. The RCS problem consists in finding a pressure and a velocity. I will call P pressure and U velocity such that these two equations hold. OK? These two equations hold. So I have written the equations in the original form. K, K is the permeability, so this is the uh, porosity, if you wish. So um, and I have written a minus sign here, which is what uh, is usually done. Although when you have the equation, you can put a plus everywhere, of course. So we have to find the velocity u and the pressure p solution of this system. And you see that it looks very much like the Stokes problem, but instead of having the Laplacian on the velocity, we only have the velocity. So instead of having second derivatives of velocity, we have no derivatives of velocity. Okay, We have no derivatives of velocity. And then the important thing to understand is that the essential boundary conditions that you choose depend on the functional setting of the problem that we will see now. And which is this functional setting? OK, so let's do the following. Let's obtain the weak form of the problem. So depending on what we want, we can choose the functional setting. So it's not given. We will see here an example in which you can choose where you want the functions uh, uh, to, be find, to be found. So let's write. I, I am, I, exactly. Let's write the, the Darcy's operator in this way. So we have one component, which is minus 1 over ku. k is a positive constant minus gradient of p, and the second component is the divergence of u. So in order to obtain the weak form of the problem, what we will do is we will test this operator L, 
against a test function v q, v is the test function for the first equation, and q is the test function for the second equation, and we will get a bilinear form, p, that will depend on u p and v q, plus, go out, plus a bound, that's it, plus a boundary term, a boundary term that will have, this is very important to understand, that will have certain terms that I will call fluxes of, of the unknown, up, and a certain operator applied on the, on the test function that I will call Dirichlet operator. Okay? So, I will get an expression of this form after integration by parts. Okay? The point is that we have two possibilities. We have two possibilities. In the first case, we don't integrate the first equation, but integrate by parts the second. You see? We test this against Q, against Q, and we integrate by parts that equation. So instead of having Q divergence of U, we have gradient of Q, U. And that leads to a boundary term, which is the normal component of U times Q. Okay? That's one possibility. To integrate by parts, sorry, to integrate by parts the second term. And the other possibility would be to integrate by parts the first term, this one. We multiply that by, as we did for the Stokes problem, we multiply that by, by V and integrate by parts. We get P divergence of V with a change of sign, uh, and that will lead us to a boundary term that is this one. Okay? So, which is... Um, which are the essential boundary conditions that we shall fix in each case. That is what will be called primal problem, and that is what will be called dual problem. We will see later in the next slide why. So, what is F, what I called the flux? The flux in the primal problem is the normal component of the velocity. Okay, The normal component of the velocity. And the direct uh, operator is Q. So, in the first case, we will be able to prescribe P equals to P bar, assert a Dirichlet condition, on the pressure. That's in the, in the primal problem. Whereas, for the dual problem, the flux is P. You see, the flux is the pressure itself. Okay? And what we will be able to prescribe is the normal component of the velocity. So, the normal component of the velocity will be prescribed in the case of the dual form D. Okay? So, we have two options that depend on whether we integrate by parts one term or we integrate by parts the other term. So, either we integrate by parts this term or we integrate by parts that one. We get the primal or the dual form. So, let's see which is the functional setting of the problem. Which is the space for Q in the primal form and in the dual form? Let's look. In the primal form, it's clear. We need U excuse me, P, we need P to be H1 because we have gradients of P and the test function. And we only need the velocity to be in L2. Okay? So, in the primal problem, the uh, pressure needs to be in H1 and the velocity needs to be in L2. And this is the bilinear form of the uh, primal form. Those are the fluxes and this is, well, this is the fluxes, Fn, what I wrote here, Fn is the normal component of the flux. So, that's why the flux is, uh, the flux is uh, U and the normal component is Un. The directly operator, what we prescribe is, is the pressure. That is what we prescribe. And I didn't say that, but um, the uh, trace space is H1 half. This is a technicality, which means that... Uh, if the pressure is in H1, the value of the pressure on the boundary belongs to a space that is called H1. So, if you know it, okay. If you don't, forget it. It turns out also <coughs> that uh, Darcy's problem can be understood as the minimization. So, so, that problem can be understood as the minimization of a certain functional. It turns out that the functional, the optimal point, the, in fact, the saddle point of which is the solution to Darcy's problem is this one. Okay? That's the functional whose optimal point, whose subtle point, is the solution of the cis problem. What happens with the dual form? If we go to the dual form, let's look here. Here we only have pressures. So pressure needs to belong only to L2. However, 
for the divergence we have, that excuse me, for the velocity we have the velocity alone and the divergence of the velocity. So the ve the velocity and the divergence must be in L two. That's a space that is called H dip. I don't know if you know that space. It's H dip, the space of functions such that the function and the divergence belongs to L two. Okay. That space is called H dip. So you see the different functional setting H one L two L two H dip. So here you have <coughs> more regularity for the velocity, and here we have more. Excuse me, we have more regularity for the velocity, <coughs> and here we have here we have more regularity for the pressure, and here we have more regularity for the velocity. Okay, that's the bilinear form in the case of the dual problem. That's the flux for the dual problem, and this is the condition that we fix, that we impose for the dual problem, and this is the space of traces, the space where the, the that velocity, that uh, normal component belongs. There's again a technicality. This, in fact, is the dual of this, but this is a technical issue, so I will not insist. Okay, so you see that we have these two views of the same problem, but. Can anybody tell me why the primal form is almost no interesting, or has almost no interest? Let me see if you can tell me why the primal form is not very interesting. Why this, this is not interesting? It's a delicate question, but if you know it, you understand everything. It doesn't mean that if you don't un, uh, know the answer, you don't understand. Okay. Why is this problem not interesting? Pity on you. More regularity in U and less in P, yes. 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 But that problem is also very, 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 very interesting, but not written in this way. In the Busca condition, it's simpler. The answer is simpler, but maybe more difficult to find. It's difficult to find, but very simple, the answer. <coughs> imagine, I don't know if you are, uh, let's say, trained to think in physical terms, but imagine this is a heat problem. There is a very good clue. Imagine P is temperature. Imagine P is temperature. What would be U? If P is temperature, what would be the meaning of U? The physical meaning of U? The rate of change. The gradient of temperature is what? Or how is the gradient of temperature called? Is what? Yes, yes. And say, I think you said that correctly. What did you say? No? What is the meaning of the gradient of temperature by a certain scalar? By k, the gradient of the temperature multiplied by k is equal to what? Suppose that f is equal to zero. What? What is the gradient of k of temperature multiplied by k? What is the gradient of the temperature multiplied by k? That is what? Heat flux. Engineer said that. You're an engineer, right? <laughs> uh, heat flux. It's the heat flux. So it says that. Imagine this is a, a heat problem. It has that uh, U minus heat flux minus gradient of temperature equal to zero, for example, and divergence of the heat flux equal to G, the source. But then what, do you, what would you do if you had a heat problem? What would you do? Would you write it this way? At the, at the continuous level, there is something that you should be tempted to do. You should be tempted, if you have an equation like that, I mean, you should be tempted to do what? To make the problem simpler. You have here two equations with two unknowns. Couldn't you reduce the problem? How? How could you reduce the problem? What? Exactly. 
take the divergence of the first equation, or even simpler, obtain, uh, isolate u from the first equation and insert it in the second. It's the same. <laughs> and then, what would happen? You would have the divergence of the gradient of p equal to something. And you would solve for p. <coughs> That's it. Uh, p, the temperature. But that would be, where would be the problem posed in that case? If we, we would have Laplacian of p equal to something, which would be the functional setting of that problem? Where p should belong for Poisson's problem? H1 and, and the flux? The gradient of p? L2? So that's exactly Poisson's problem. You see? The reason why this is not interesting, almost not interesting, is that if you have p in H1 and u in L2, come on, take the divergence of the first equation and forget that problem. You see? Why do you want to deal with two, equa two equations and two unknowns? If one is enough, you don't gain anything. There is a little, a little interest, <coughs> and it's the case in which if k is nonlinear or, 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 or variable or something, you may be interested in interpolating when you go at, at the numerical level, in interpolating Q independently. But usually, pff, it's not interesting, OK? So the primal form, I mean, it's interesting for comparison, but not at the practical level, OK? What is interesting at the primal level is the dual form. Why? In the dual form, you have U and you have P. And as somebody said before, in the, in the dual form, we have more regularity for U than for P. That essentially means that we want more a smoother velocities than pressures. So we want to have our variable of interest is not the pressure, but the velocity. And that happens, for example, in porous media flow. In porous media flow, this is exactly the situation. We are more interested in the velocities, in the, in the, in the flow velocities, than in the pressures. That's why it is convenient to write the flow equations. This is the so-called Darcy's model. Darcy's model arose in, 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 in porous media flow. In porous media flow, it is more, more interesting to uh, sometimes to obtain a good approximation for the velocities than for the pressure. That's why the dual form is of interest. The primal form is just Poisson's problem. Okay? You see that the functional setting matters, determines everything. The functional setting of the problem determines everything. The same equations, if you look at that from the classical point of view, if you have classical eyes, you don't see the difference. You see? If you have classical eyes, you have a, I mean, that is trivial. And in most books in engineering, they don't see the difference between the primal and the dual form, of course. I mean, <laughs> you just replace that here, and you are done. Why do you want to deal with pressure and velocity if dealing with velocity is enough, uh, with pressure is enough? But I mean, people that work carefully on, on, on porous media flow know the difference of both methods. Okay. Okay, that's that's his problem: primal and dual form. Let's go to Brinkman's problem, uh, and and design a general framework that encompasses both limits. So this is our work, the, what I will present here. But I think it's easy to understand. What is Brinkman's problem? So let's call uh, one over k. Let's call it sigma. And I have changed the signs here because these these are the signs that are used in uh, in fluid mechanics for the Navier-Stokes equations. Okay. So Brinkman's problem is a problem that combines the Laplacian and the zero order term. So we have both, OK? So it's like a, a flow with porosity. So it's a flow in a medium that, is, uh, that has not infinite permeability, but has uh, a finite one, a finite permeability. Um, so that's the problem that we want to solve. And usually, in, in, in a, most of the cases, we are interested in g equal to 0. But if g is not 0, it's not an issue. OK. As boundary, we are, will be concerned in the case in which the boundary conditions are u equal to 0 when the viscosity is positive. And when it's not, we will be interested in the case that the normal component is only, only the normal, not the whole viscosity, but the, uh, the whole velocity, but only the normal component is equal to 0. So what happens? This is what we, uh, one of the examples of a singularly perturbed problem. Because when nu is positive, the velocity has to belong to h1. And when we know goes to 0, which is the natural limit? The natural limit is the dual form. The natural limit is the dual form in which the velocity belongs to h dip. Okay? So the dual form is also the natural limit of the singular perturbation problem of, uh, the, Bring, uh, of the, Brinkman, the Brinkman equations. Okay? Is that clear? 
Good. So that is the bilinear, bilinear form of the problem. That is the linear form of the problem. So it's written here. Nothing to say. Here we have uh, viscous term, the new porosity term, the pressure gradient integrated by parts. So we uh, that will be the limit will be the dual form of Darcy's problem when nu goes to zero, and that is the incompressibility term. And now we have a contribution from the momentum equation and a contribution from the continuity equation. But this is not important. Okay, that's the variational form of the problem. That's what I have said so far. If nu is equal to zero, that is in the case of Darcy's problem, the problem can be thought, as I said before, in two different ways. This is what I have said here. First, the singular limit. In this case, we require that u belongs to h dip. h dip zero, that zero means that the normal component of the velocity is zero, and u equals zero. h one zero, remember that h one zero means that the normal component of, uh, no, excuse me, the whole vector is zero. Uh, and in h dip, in h dip, h dip zero means that only the normal component is zero. Pressures are in L2, modulo constants, because the, uh, they are not defined. The, uh, f the forcing term has to belong to this space and the forcing term of the continuity equation to this one. And then the second possibility is a mixed formulation of Poisson's problem. Okay, you know, that's what I said before. In this case, the functional setting is this one. Okay? And, um, okay. So let's design a, 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 a problem that a functional framework that encompasses both cases. This is a little, the idea is simple, but uh, that was useful to us to design our methods. So let's see, this is a little bit of analysis, not much. A little bit of analysis, but not much. Let's define this operator, LU, which is the Stokes plus the, the zero order term. Okay? Let's define this operator. And the associated graph norm. What is the graph norm of an operator? It's nothing but what you get, in, in, in the case of positive definite operators, is what you get when you test the operator against U itself. So U, LU, and, and integrate, that's the graph norm. In our case, the graph norm is clearly this one. So it has nu gradient of u squared plus sigma u squared. When we test against u and integrate by parts, this is the graph norm. Okay? Now, now that we define one norm, you, def you know that uh, Banach spaces, Banach spaces in, uh, of interest, not all, but Banach spaces of interest can be defined as the closure of very smooth functions with respect to a certain norm. Do you know that? I don't know if you have introduced uh, H1, for example, as, as, uh, as the closure of, of the test functions, so, so the functions that are infinitely smooth with respect to a given norm. So this may be not the usual way to introduce uh, a Banach space, but in this case, it's the, use, the, uh, the useful one. Okay? So you take sp the space of, func of functions that are very, very smooth, C infinity, that vanish on the boundary, by the way, that are vector functions, vector functions. And then you take the closure with respect to this norm. What does it mean, the closure with respect to this norm? The closure, you know that <coughs> the, uh, this uh, is, is the set of, the, the, of course, is all these functions plus all the possible limits, all the possible limits of sequences in this space for which this norm is bounded. Okay? All, you take the, the this is, uh, I don't know how much you know about functional analysis, but that's the, um, that's the um, sometimes called completeness uh, theorem, okay? Because Banach spaces, by definition, are normed spaces that are complete. That means that the limit of Cauchy sequences belong to that space. And when you have a space, you can complete it. How do you complete a space? By adding the limits of Cauchy sequences. Oh, you know that, okay? Great, perfect. Good. So you can define that space as the closure of this one. And then you can define the dual. Once you have defined that space, you can define the dual. And the dual is precisely, uh, 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 in partial differential equations, we always base the duality we always base it on the integral, as I said before. So the duality is always based on the integral. So the bilinear form that allows you to define duality is the integral, always. So we define a duality in this way. We define the, duality, the, du uh, the norm of the dual space as the supremum of the integral of u times v divided by the norm, the L norm, of uh, v, normalized by the norm. Okay, so that is the dual norm, and it turns out that when the viscosity is positive, when this, this term is positive, what happens? When this term is positive, which is the space we are working with? Obviously, the space where we're, this norm is equivalent to the H1 norm, 
when this one is positive, we are working with the H1 norm. And we have that v, VL is H1 and the dual is H minus 1. And when nu is equal to 0, we are working essentially with L2. That is L2, and the dual of L2 is L2 itself. L2 is a reflexive space. It's a well, the dual is equal to itself. Okay, so we are able to deal with the two limit cases. Okay. Well, it turns out that it is crucial. It is crucial to define a length scale. We will see that uh, tomorrow. It is crucial to define the length scale. Let's introduce at least a length scale L to the problem. And you could say, um, well, that length scale has to be chosen. I would say yes. But you could chosen intrinsically to the problem. That could be, for example, the length, the length scale that appears in, in uh, Poincare Friedrich's inequality. So all problems have a length scale, even if, though it's not explicitly displayed, it, it is there. If you have a, a Poincare Friedrich's inequality, that you can define the constant that appears there, you can define it as a length scale. Um, the reason is that, uh, what is the problem? The problem is that if we want to take the limit when nu tends to 0, we want to control not only, not only the L2 norm of u, but also the divergence of u. That's why we will have to introduce a length scale. So now we define another space, which is the closure of the C-infinity functions with compact support with respect to that norm, which is the norm of L, that is what we have seen before, that contains both the L2 norm of the gradient multiplied by viscosity and the L2 norm of the function multiplied by the porosity, plus some control on the divergence. And to make it um, dimensionally consistent, you have to multiply to, to be able to add that. You know, if we were doing only mathematics, we wouldn't care. We could add to, the, to that norm, we would add this one. But we are not doing only mathematics. We are doing numerical analysis. And we want to show and we want to see that things behave well well in the limit of the parameters, when they go to 0 or when they go to infinity. Okay? So in order to be able to add the divergence to this norm, we have to multiply by this scaling coefficient. <coughs> that has the right units. That has the right units. How do you see that it has the right units? You see, the norm of L, con the norm L, if you take the square, contains the square root of sigma and the norm of u. <coughs> Sorry. So that if you want to add the norm of the divergence and you want to be to scale correctly, the divergence introduces a unit that is one over length. Therefore, you have to multiply by a length. You have to add. In, in, in numerical analysis, it is very important to add apples and apples and pears and pears. You know that's uh, very important. You cannot add one thing and the other because uh, when you change units, you may get wrong results. One thing is analysis, mathematical analysis in a classical sense. And the other thing is numerical analysis. Okay? <coughs> so we define this space V that is the closure of, uh, of the test functions in this norm. And then Q is the closure of the C infinity functions with respect to this one. And why do we want to define this norm? Because we always want to control the pressure. But in the case in which uh, it might be interesting as well to control the gradient of the pressure. Okay, the gradient of the pressure in some cases hmm? that we will see in the numerical analysis. Okay, great. And the scaling coefficient now again has to be this one. That is the scaling coefficient that you need. When the viscosity is zero, is zero something remains here. When the viscosity is zero, so, something remains. What what happens? Um, uh, that is what is said here. The pair v times q reduces to h1 times l2. In the case of uh, in the case of uh, uh, non-zero viscosity, and be careful to h deep h1 when the viscosity is zero h1 because that would be uh, the L2 norm of gradient of Q. Of course, the, the pressure will not belong to that one. I am defining that norm that will uh, be useful in the analysis when we want to prove convergence with uh, uh, for a smooth pressure. We will see why. We will see why. And finally, oof, at the end, we define the fi this norm this triple norm, which is that norm, which was defined here, for the velocity and that norm for the pressure. That happens to be the finest norm in which the problem is well posed. We have a theorem proving that. And that means, what does that mean? It means that the, if, uh, in general, um, maybe you don't have pressures in H2, 
in, in H1. But if you have, that you will be able to control them in this space. Okay? Well, you will see that more clearly in the numerical analysis. All this is what? All this is, uh, all this, uh, is a framework. All this is a framework to obtain this uh, result. You see, we haven't done numerics here. Okay? This is just a result of partial differential equations, uh, variational methods, which says that uh, the, the continuous problem is stable, is well posed. It turns out that there exists a constant such that for all velocities, or excuse me, velocity pressures, for all unknowns, there exists a test function for which this holds. And what is that? This is an imp subcondition. This is an imp subcondition. The only point is that, in fact, the norm of the test function, excuse me, of the test function, is slightly different to the norm of the unknown. This is a technicality. You, you, you don't need to understand that for the moment. That working norm is optimal when there is no, you see, when there is no um, uh, permeability, when we are dealing with the Stokes problem, this is the norm that we have, which is the norm of the Stokes problem. Why is this the norm of the Stokes problem? Because we have H1 for velocity, remember that this is equivalent to H1 because of Poincare physics inequality, L2 for pressure, and this is nothing. Because if we know that pressure is bounded in L2, it is bounded in H minus 1. Oh, so, so the gradient is bounded in H minus 1. Okay? If the pressure is bounded in uh, so if, if the pressure is L2, the gradient of the pressure is H minus 1. So that's what it says. Good. And in the case of um, in the case of zero viscosity, that is the norm. So the good thing is that we have the L2 norm of the velocity, the L2 norm of the divergence of the velocity. So that is the H deep norm of the velocity. And we also have the L2 norm of the pressure and L2, the L2 norm of the pressure gradient. So this is the finest norm in which we can prove stability. The finest norm in which we can prove stability. In the case of the dual problem, if we are interested in the dual problem, we are only interested in, in these three terms, 1, 2, and 3. So in the case of the dual problem, we can delete the last term. And which is the term that we delete in the case of the primal problem? So, in the case that is not useful in the case of the primal problem of those four, when the viscosity is zero, that means for the cis problem, the, the, in, the, in the dual problem, we don't need that one. In the primal problem, which is the one that we don't need? Which one? Remember, in the primal problem, in the primal po problem, pressures are in H1 and velocities are where? Only in L2 all in L2, and that is the term that we would delete in the case of the primal form of the problem, okay? Okay, of course, you will obtain a stability in, that, in, in, in the whole norm only if data is regular enough. If data is regular, the stability can be proved in norms weaker than that. That's what I'm saying. If the data is the minimum for which these equations are well posed, so we will not be able to obtain that estimate for the primal form, and we will not be able to obtain that estimate for the dual form. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. Okay. Okay. So that's the problem. Tomorrow we will do finite elements on that. And uh, but I think the, the, uh, well that that is what we do. But I think the the first two sections were were perhaps the most interesting. So tomorrow we will apply the finite element method to obtain that. Okay. We will uh, the plan then tomorrow will be tomorrow is the last day. So tomorrow the plan will be. Um, I'll try to condense a little bit those uh, three parts, th those four talks. So we have finished uh, variational multiscale for large eddy simulation. This is Darcy. Then I will I will dedicate maybe 40 minutes to that, and the remaining 50 minutes to 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 MHD. Try to shorten that. And tomorrow afternoon uh, we may dedicate, let's say, half the session to waves. Oh no, half the session to the questions and the other half to waves, if, if that's correct, okay? Good, so see you tomorrow then.